Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and all my NB friends. You are listening to KGNU, and you are listening to Sacred Voices on KGNU. Uh, as you can hear, we have some special guests in the studio today. Um, with me, I have Eutimia Cruz. Am I saying that right? It's Eutimia Cruz Montoya. Eutimia Cruz Montoya. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah. You have brought your wonderful son here with you. Yes, Ming San Teocali. <laughs> and thank you so much for bringing him along. A lot of what we will be talking about today is your new journey into motherhood, but we will get to that because first I want to talk to you about how you were the featured performer at the previous month's uh, Sacred Voices open mic. Yeah. Um, our host, Franklin, introduced you. He gave you quite an introduction. He said yeah. that you were... Uh, like a, a poet, a dancer, a healer, and then he listed off like 14 other things for you. Oh, my baby. <laughs> We're having a bit of a moment here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> luckily I have my my friend. Yeah. It's okay, we might thank be you. Taking... It's okay, I think we you have You can leave that here, now. Speechy. He likes to walk around. He's an aventurero. <laughs> We like to keep it authentic here on this program. Um, so. He's already looking up and around. He's like, okay, that's better. Oh. Take me. <laughs> so anyway, um, you got quite the introduction at our open mic. And uh, there were so many things listed off. I'm just curious how all of these different things come together to form who you are and what you do. <laughs> huh. That's an interesting uh, way to pose a, qu a question, a quandary. Um, I believe people come into existence in this particular lifetime with a set of gifts, responsibilities, um, personalities that are meant to fulfill the contract between heaven and earth to use um, theoretical understanding of Chinese medicine. Humans come to fulfill the contract between heaven and earth. Um, so uh, the way to do that is to be the most authentic possible. So uh, you can choose to say yes to your don, which is what a, a word we use in curanderismo, um, which pretty much means like your gift, your the bestowal of mm -hmm. what you came here to offer. Um, or you could choose to ignore it. And uh, there's a lot of things involved, nature, nurture, etc. cetera. Um, but if you choose to accept, then you listen and you, you obey. I see. <laughs> That's all very interesting. You have, uh, I... I, I saw your performance, and you have such a way of, uh, you know, putting things about the way life is and the way that life connects to nature and yourself and everyone around you. It's it's very interesting to listen to. I, I haven't heard many people talk I have a question about for you. Sure, okay. What do you mean interesting? Interesting? Yeah, Keep interesting, using that. Interesting in that it makes me think. You know, it makes me have... Uh, you know, I, I hear this, and then it makes me, you know, try to think critically about what these things that you're saying mean and how it relates to me and everyone else, mm. if that makes sense. Okay. So just now when I was talking about the, the relationship of the contract between heaven and earth mm -hmm. and myself, what would that make you think of? Um, it made me think of how uh, it relates to me and, you know, how I could do this or... Think about things in the same way that you are, I okay. suppose. <laughs> I haven't had somebody try to flip the questions back on me yet. That's, <laughs> that's a new one for me. <laughs> um, so at the open mic that we did, your performance, you did quite a few things, actually. You performed a song, you talked about your work, and then you engaged everyone. You, you told everybody to stand up and to move the chairs out of the way and form a circle in the middle of the audience, which mm -hmm. is something I had not seen somebody do before. It was very interesting. I keep saying interesting now. You, you've pointed it out to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 
that word it's can a, mean so many things. Yeah. And I feel like language hides a lot. I, so. I see what you mean. But um, so you did all of these different things. I, I'm just curious uh, what your motivation was behind each part of it. And, you know, just talk about your performance in general. Okay, well, um, hmm, where to start? I was raised doing Danza Azteca, which is like Danza Mexicayot in Denver in the Chicano community, um, so which is um, a call back to ancient Mexico and ritualism therein. Uh, and when I was 24, I'm 35, when I was 24, I went to Chinese medicine school. Um, and the, at the end of a year, of working with a Chinese medicine doctor, actually two years um, post college, where I got a degree at Stanford University in medical anthropology. <clears throat> I had started studying Chinese medicine with Dr. Ron Rosen, who is now a late and great human in my world. Um, and he passed away the summer before I started Chinese medicine school. And um, since being involved in Danza Mexica and the, the Red Road, the indigenous spiritual community growing up, um, and then going and getting a secular education and then joining Chinese medicine school and getting all these different world views, then coming home after Stanford <clears throat> and going back out, I moved to the Bay Area to study Chinese medicine preliminarily. Uh, there was a lot of reckoning I had to do within my own understanding and like what worldview, parentheses S, what worldviews I was coming from. Right. And something I realized, and I'm still realizing and I'm still seeing, especially in the last few years and especially now that like social media and different voices have taken such a strong presence of decolonizing work and um, the voices of people of color are becoming much more prominent and the rage of colonialism and you know, the enslaved and the genocided upon, et cetera, are coming to the present day um, zeitgeist mm -hmm. in a way that is empowering and that gives zero F-U-C-Ks. Can I say that on public? <laughs> I might have to Can ask I spell my things boss on public. That. I, mean, I was going to, I was, really I, sure. I, anyways. Um, we'll figure that one out. <laughs> about the powers that be and the forces and the feelings of white people, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I came to realize right now and through my practice um, how much colonialism still lives, even in indigenous movements um, and in the civil rights movement, for instance, my mom and dad met during the Chicano civil rights movement. Um, mm. And even in my own ceremonial uh, upbringing in Danza Azteca, that was very, um, very conquistador in many ways, very Catholic, very mm. like cover up and the women, you know, don't, don't be too loud, don't be too much, don't be too bold, don't be too beautiful, definitely don't be too naked, um, <laughs> et cetera, and how patriarchal and colonial that was. Mm -hmm. Then I started studying, um, when I started getting more into my spiritual path and honoring my legacy of curanderismo that, that exists on both sides of my lineage, maternal and paternal, um, it just came clear to me how even in my upbringing as a danzante, there was this kind of prescribed um, middleman, like much like a church in a mm -hmm. patriarchal way, where the co colonizer comes in, takes away your connection with God, takes away your song, takes away your dance, takes away um, your earth, mm -hmm. you know, cement on everything. So you have to look outside of yourself for God, mm -hmm. for the great, yeah. for each other. You have to go to a place every Tuesday and Thursday or every Sunday to get community. Right? Right, right and all the streets if you walk out onto the street you see um you you look one way and you see nothing but street and you look the other way and you see nothing but street there's no plazas in the same way mm -hmm. anymore right um <clears throat> so in this reckoning this realization of how deeply entrenched the colonialism is mm -hmm. um i have 
grown my own personal practice as a reflection and an immersion within my healing practice and my community practice and my quote unquote performative practice Mm -hmm. um, as a reconnection to connection. I see what you're saying. That's a, I think it's a very important conversation to be having now and one that's uh, becoming increasingly loud and present about colonialism Mm -hmm. as it has existed um, for hundreds of years, it never stopped, really, and I think oh, it's are, it keeps going. There's yeah. New Age colonialism, aka gentrification. Now, right, right, mm-hmm. and that's a conversation that I'm hearing a lot more of lately, and I'm I'm very happy to hear that. It's something that people in the past have not known enough about, and I mean now still probably don't know enough about, but uh, we're everybody's learning, and that's that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I uh, so your what what would you call uh, would you call it like a, a healing session uh, when we uh, when everybody stood around in a circle in the audience? Yeah, or? so I actually it was interesting when I got asked to do this by Franklin, who um, is like I consider a brother from another mother, a <laughs> dear soul friend of mine, who is actually a dear soul friend of my partner before we even met. So mm. um, my partner and I had a few dear soul people in common when we started hanging out. So mm. I figured that's confirmation in its other own kind of way yeah but um when he reached out to me yes i've done poetry yes i've done song yes i've done dance in a performative way um Mm -hmm. but something just said like let spirit guide your offering when you get there Mm -hmm. so even though i have books of poetry even though i have poems memorized like when i got up on stage i started talking about my work Mm -hmm. as um a holistic healthcare practitioner or a harmonizer of the four pillars of wellness, mental, right. emotional, spiritual, and physical. Um, <clears throat> and it just was like, when I'm listening, it's very active. So I like I feel like stages in particular and podiums, et cetera, even microphones mm-hmm. are tools of colonialism mm. um, and separation. So for me, it's like if I'm actually practicing what I'm preaching and honoring what I'm trying to accomplish as a a medium, a channel, a force in this world, I'm going to unite everyone. So there wasn't it wasn't um, it wasn't really a plan. It was a calling in the moment to put everyone into a circle. And you you got off the stage, you put the microphone to the side and you were in the circle just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, it's uh, good to get some some context and understanding about what that was. Yeah. Um, so you have um, tried to heal and talk to a lot of people. Uh, what do you find most common <laughs> is uh, you know plaguing people nowadays? What do they need the most help with? Healing from colonialism (laughs) um well what came through in the performance quote unquote the the session that we all moved into with one another when i was called to perform um was a kind of a introduction or a remembering a recognition a lesson if you will about organ placement in Mm -hmm. the body and their functions. Um, So I pretty much took everyone through a guided meditation of sorts of connecting to their organs and the functions of their organs and moving energy of the body through with the hands Mm -hmm. um, and the intention and the breath, et cetera, pretty much whatever came through. I think we called in the energy of the creepy crawlers, like the (laughs) earthworms. Right that help things move from darkness, um, the dark crevices of the earth, Mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, So when I said reconnect to connection, uh, it's very much so material Mm -hmm. as well as spiritual, uh, where we've been told that we don't know. And we, it's, I, it's been almost systematized in our American culture and Western culture to ask somebody else what's wrong with you. 
Yeah. Right? So like, oh, I have this pain here. I need to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor runs all these tests, you know, but you you don't see how much they cost because the insurance industrial complex that you've been paying in for years and years and years and years, plus your copay, plus your deductible, but, you know, Medicare or whatever takes care of it uh, and you Mm -hmm. don't see that. And then this doctor who went to all of these years of medical school who it's shifting but is most likely a white human being or a a descendant of colonial Mm -hmm. colonizers. Um, Not to be like, I I don't like to be, I'm not trying to be divisive. I'm trying to keep it real. Yeah. And even if it is a person of color in this system, they were in the school system that was devised by colonizers who also smear campaigned um, indigenous and African descent healers um, and then criminalized them for practicing medicine, Mm -hmm. their medicine, original medicine. Um, So we're looking at our wellness through the lens of the colonizer, through the lens of the oppressor, through the lens of the don't, have power i have power Mm -hmm. uh and then we give this human who spends 10 15 if we're lucky 15 minutes with us all of the power to quote unquote heal us and unfortunately because of the medical industrial complex and the pharmaceutical industry probably can't heal us either they're just going to (laughs) mask our symptoms with a a prescription or three because one pill does this and this side effects and this pill combats those side effects and this pill which wreaks havoc on our liver and our kidneys right uh so part of what i like to do is remind people of our own feelings and our own bodies so like you can go oh that actually pain was coming from my liver actually it's underneath my liver which is where my gallbladder lives which is responsible Mm -hmm. for metabolizing fats and i've been eating a bunch of hydrogenated oils Mm -hmm. um which are cheap and then the cycle of poverty and illness and pharmaceutical profit continues Yeah. yeah (laughs) <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. I've uh, been hearing recently that, uh, you know, people are on so many medications that they don't even know, like, what they're on. Like, if a doctor asks them, like, well, what what are you taking right now? They won't be able to answer because, you know, they're taking, like, eight pills, as, like, as you said, one for whatever cause they deem appropriate, but then all the rest of them are to combat the side effects of the others and stuff like that. And I think it is important, like you're try, like you're doing, to teach people about their own health and their own bodies because people, they aren't in touch with that. They don't. They can't really say like what's wrong with them. They, they just, you know. Well, you know what the cool thing is is yeah. that they can say what's wrong with them. But mm. the the tool of the oppressor has been to delegitimize your own understanding of your own experience. Oh, I see. And and then even. Like, furthermore, back in the days of, uh, well, it doesn't even have to be back in the days, like Indian schools and slavery, Mm -hmm. you were straight up beaten or shamed or killed or hung or, um, what are they, when they take your hair off? Uh, Scalping. Yep. For, For your own, like empowerment of your own understanding of your own self. Right. So it's, it's not even just like, that we're we're kind of scared it's mm-hmm. that like like for instance my grandmother was a spanish first language mestiza woman from uh, she was actually born in denver her parents oh. came from new mexico and that's a whole other story <laughs> but um she was beaten for speaking spanish wow in school here in denver and when i was about and so so her and her husband would only speak spanish when they wanted my mother and her sisters to not understand something Mm. so we like i grew up saying i speak spanglish because there were words that we had that were spanish but when i would ask when i was about in middle school i would ask my grandmother like hey what how do you say this in spanish how do you say this she could only speak spanish if she wasn't intentionally trying to and things just came out of her mouth Mm. but her um trauma response yeah. was don't speak Spanish, it isn't safe, right? Yeah. So don't trust your own intuition, don't trust your own desire to dance mm-hmm. because what if they see you and then what'll happen, right? Right. Don't trust your song, don't sing, don't let them catch you singing. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't that's, let them catch you gathering. <laughs> that's a very uh, direct example of uh, colonialism. Mm-hmm. It's just very, very apparent, very evident. Yeah. 
So that, that exists for our bodies and understanding our bodies, like especially sexually as well, like don't touch your vagina, don't touch your penis, like masturbation is a sin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like keep, keep, and then the whole birthing industry, keep us away from the power of birth, make women believe that we are um, unable to birth through our vaginas, that our hips are not big enough, that we can't breastfeed because our nipples mm -hmm. are too big or whatever. If you keep a narrative going of mm -hmm. don't trust your body, who has all the power? Not the people. Right. That's a, that's a very good point. And uh, with, with that, I think it's a good place to transition into uh, your own experience with motherhood because hey. uh, your, your son who we just heard earlier, that is your first child, right? Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us about that whole experience, I, I have a feeling you have a lot to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Talk about putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so like I said, I'm 35. Uh, I was a late mother in my culture. Um, it was funny. My mom had a talk with me when I was like a preteen about not getting pregnant during <laughs> my teenage years. And, you know, then I was in college and then I was wanted to go to grad school. So it was cool. But then probably about six, seven, eight years ago and I was like 27, 28. She's kind of like, so daughter, um, what about those babies? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like not just like that. But I was like, well, I'm um, still I don't, I don't know, like yeah. not yet. So actually pretty soon, uh, a little bit before I got pregnant, I was like pretty sure I'm like, you know, maybe I won't have kids. Maybe I'm just going to do my career. Um and I told my mom that, and I was, like, pregnant a month later. <laughs> so, you know, my mom always said the babies come when they're ready. Right. Um, so, yeah, I it was my own. It's, he's my only seed, my only baby. I don't have any, any babies in the ancestor realm. Um, mm. I had never been pregnant before. I wasn't oh. sure I could get pregnant. Um, I do believe that my chosen partner came for the purpose of bringing my child and i believe my child chose him mm. um if any of you out there know us both together y'all can feel it um <laughs> my partner is a very special human <clears throat> and uh I wanted, be, because I've known this about colonialism and furthermore the history of um, OBGYN in the United States of America is wrought with torturous, horrible histories of um, experimentations on black women, enslaved women, mm. on indigenous women um, without anesthesia. And that that was no legacy I wanted anywhere near my pregnancy, my child at all. Of course. Um, <clears throat> so I personally was born through an emergency C-section that I do believe was warranted by virtue mm. of my mother's condition, mm. um, which I also think came, again, from colonialism. Um, as a healthcare practitioner, um, and for clarification's sake, I am a licensed Chinese medicine doctor and mm -hmm. acupuncturist. Um, I have a lot of training in other modalities, including yoga um, and uh, curanderismo, so that's like folk medicine. I have been working for a few years now with um, a beautiful, powerful healer um, who goes by Indige Mama. Her name is Panquetsani, and she has an unbroken lineage of birthing practices, postpartum care um, from the Mexica tradition from Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's just a lot of, of ways, and again, I was raised on the Red Road, um, there's just a lot for me that I did not want energetically on my baby, especially the like the ambiance, the energy, the presence of the fear mongering um, that colonization has created with mm -hmm. people for the dom purpose of domineering the and the control of outcomes in my experience and opinion. Um, so that said, I was born in emergency sex in, in an emergency C-section on Christmas morning in 1983 in a storm. Oh. And uh, my mother had fibroid tumors and a placenta previa, which means the placenta is blocking the birth canal. And oh. most women would bleed out because if the placenta tears, it's a hemorrhage for sure. Um, that said, placenta previa is, is usually more... In, happens more in women who have previous c-section experience because the placenta is more likely to attach at the site of 
scar tissue. Uh-huh. So uh, there's, it's, it's very nuanced. It's very deep. It's very complex the way these medical issues come about. Mm-hmm. Um, fibroids themselves, I've seen in my own medical practice and through my studies of indigenous and original medicine, um, I include Chinese medicine as indigenous medicine because mm-hmm. the Chinese were not colonized and the medicine of China is thousands and thousands of years old, lineage-based. Um, in the 50s, Mao came in and did some colonization effery too. But... Mm. Um, so uh, in my understanding and in my understanding of uh, the fact that we are full, fully spiritual beings on a human journey and all of our illnesses are connected to our spirit sickness, mm-hmm. like colonialism, like rape in our lineages, um, in our personal lives, that when women have uh, womb issues, when, when womb-bearing people have illnesses of the womb it is related to sexual shame it is related to the rape in our lineages or our personal rape it is related to um self-hate based on the virgin whore dichotomy belief system mm-hmm. uh, etc and so on and so forth so i personally believe <laughs> and i'm maybe i'm just full of myself but okay i am what i am <laughs> um that if if like my mom knew then what i know now there could have been a different outcome. Hmm. But as it stood, I do believe that that the emergency C-section was warranted at 33 weeks. So I was born on Christmas morning at 33 weeks gestation. And um, they put I was premature, so they put me in an incubator. Oh. And my, my brother was uh, a, a little more than a year older than me, 14 months. And so I was in the hospital for a f- couple of months in an incubator. Oh, wow. And while I was pregnant, I was meditating. I had a really intense pregnant experience. Like we go back, we go deep when we're pregnant. Hmm. All of our mama stuff comes up. And um, I had a memory of being in the incubator oh. and deeply, deeply grieving my mother and I grieved her in that bathtub that evening, that that two months without her that they took me from her mm. for medical whatever. Right. Uh, I wanted none of that for my baby. Of course. <laughs> none of that for my baby. I want none of that for babies. Yeah. And in general, if they can get you at birth, they have you. Yeah. Um, I believe this is the underlying reasoning with everything going on at the border, with taking babies away from their mother's bosom, mm-hmm. with taking children away from their parents. This is the primordial mother wound that will traumatize you for life. And after that, who's your mama? The system. <laughs> That's, um, yeah. So I chose with the the complete full thousand percent support of my partner to honor the great mystery with some guidance by my indigenous midwives. Um, And I think this is really important to share. Like we in the medical industrial system right now, we have this belief that death is bad. Um, people aren't familiar with death. People don't honor death. Like Dia de los Muertos is like a cultural fun thing nowadays with mm-hmm. all the appropriation. But really that is a way to honor the transition into the celebration of the spirit realm and the celebration of what you, you accomplished here in life and like make death not this scary thing, but just a transition of a soul mm-hmm. into another plane. Um, <clears throat> so one of the midwives said, Um, when I was debating at the beginning of my pregnancy whether I wanted to get an ultrasound, Mm. she was like, well, baby moves away from them. That's enough for me. And Mm. I just like remember all the times where women have said, oh, Mm -hmm. they couldn't find his heartbeat because Mm. the baby doesn't like the ultrasound. So they like go to the other side of the womb. Hmm. And I was like, wow. And she goes, and really it's a false sense of security because even a miscarriage is a variation of normal. Mm. Even a stillbirth is a variation of normal. And really, you can't see anything before 20 weeks anyway. You're like, oh, that's a nice circle you have there in your womb. (laughs) (laughs) You know? Um, So, yeah, we had a a fetoscope. And we, like, listened to the baby's heartbeat once you could Mm. through that. And um, I had a number of indigenously trained birth workers who I worked with. Um, I'm very present and in tune with my own body and I gave myself permission to uh, trust the great mystery, but I also gave myself permission to 
honor the blueprint of the medical industrial understanding in my blood and in my experience as a daughter of cesarean section. Mm -hmm. So I also wasn't like, F that. I was like, well, if I feel called to go to the MD or go to one of those places mm -hmm. and get an ultrasound, I'll do it. If I, if I feel the call to go to the hospital when I'm birthing, I'll do it. Um, so I didn't stop myself. I didn't like shame myself for, for that because, you know, Western medicine is good for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, it's just commodified as an, in, as, as an industry for profit. That doesn't yeah. mean the medicine is bad completely in itself, right? It's very useful at right. times. Uh, so yeah, so my pregnancy was completely without any medical anything. And then I had, uh, I went into labor the day of my due date, quote unquote. Oh, okay. um, FYI, indigenous way, we are pregnant for 10 moons, not mm. nine months. So get a moon calendar and see when you think you, you did the deed <laughs> and count 10 moons after that. And then mm. your baby will probably come. My baby was born uh, in the full moon, mm -hmm. the super blood wolf moon lunar eclipse hmm. was the day wow. my son was born january 20th 2019 um and he came shooting out of me like a light lightning bolt after 37 <laughs> hours of labor that is very rough <laughs> yes i also want to share i'm sorry i'm talking so much but this is really exciting for me no no that's that's <clears throat> why you're here that's, that's very interesting <laughs> um i do want to share that after i gave birth um, one, my son tore through me. Mm -hmm. So I had um, a tear all the way from my labia on my left side through my perineum to mm -hmm. my um, my birthing hemorrhoid on my culo, my asshole. I don't know <laughs> if I can say that on air. Let's but double check. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my midwives could sew it which was awesome. And then I had what they call trickle bleeding, which they say is more um, scary than a uh, hemorrhage because it, you like with a hemorrhage, you're like, oh my God, there's another kilo, there's another kilo. You can see how much blood, but a trickle mm -hmm. bleed is like, there's a gush and then there's not, and then there's another gush and then there's not. So mm -hmm. it's not as easy to gauge. Um, I do believe that if I, if I would have been working with an, other midwives who were more, um, versed in herbal ways to stop bleeding that mm -hmm. would have worked but the midwives that i had present at the birth that were able to be there weren't so they did shoot me in the thigh with uh pitocin and then cytotech mm -hmm. so i had a completely natural birth until the bleeding mm -hmm. and then um then i'm grateful for the pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. uh so it really humbled me out a lot as far as like being like uh, so, so everything natural. Um, and I think that was good for me and, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. I f I'm still recovering. So my son is seven months old and a lot of things have changed and my body is still coming back to its, well, n let me actually F snapback culture. Mm -hmm. Your body will never be the same. Your body will never be the same. Do not think it will be. Do not try to make it go back. Your body, your life, your clothes, your size, your breasts, your butt, your vagina, mm -hmm. it all changes. If you get a C-section, that changes your anatomy too. And that's totally okay. That's a new you. Love her too. <laughs> I, that's, a, that's a great message because I... Uh... You know, that's that's something that's kind of rampant in our, our culture. It, as soon as somebody has a baby, the, uh, all the questions turn to, well, how are you going to lose the baby weight? How are you going to get back to the way you were before? Right. Well, I know the answer to that, breastfeed. Hmm. Breastfeeding actually um, inspires oxytocin, which hmm. is a natural, um, what do they call it? Hormone. There's hmm. another word, neurotransmitter. There's It's a thing in your body that, uh, contracts the uterus yeah. so when you breastfeed your uterus actually contracts to go back to before baby size mm. and your your it takes all your calories your baby takes your calories so um, breastfeeding actually is the best way to get back mm. um, and if your baby can latch to a bottle it can definitely latch to your nipple um, I find in the hospitals there is a lot of talk toward women and I don't think it's an accident um, to say, oh, well, you can't do it. Your nipples are too big. It's too hard. Like mm. just formula feed them. And 
there is a um, connection between the people who sell the formula and how much they push it in the hospitals. And I'm not just trying to be shady about it. This is like mm -hmm. bottom line. Yeah, it's very uh, it's business. It's a business. The medical industrial complex is a business. They're trying to sell you stuff. Definitely. Um, and it's not very profitable for women to feed babies with their breast milk. That's a very good point. Um, <laughs> I think you're right The other about thing about that, if your milk isn't coming in, according to my comadre Panquezani and in her indigenous line of birth work, um, the, the single most uh, effective part of getting your milk in is being nurtured. So there's a complete lost art that exists in so many cultures around the world of a complete postpartum healing period, which I did observe. They call it the cuarentena, mm -hmm. which is 40 days. So for 40 days, you get steam baths you and, uh, with herbal steams. You get massages. Um, you People feed you caldo, good soups, um, fermented foods to help your microbiome, to help create milk. Um, a very simple recipe is like a beer and some chicken soup with the bones mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. um, to help get your milk to come in. Um, and we've completely lost that. Again, I think it's by design to disempower mothers and then the, the industry runs your baby's life. Right. Okay. Not your, you're not your baby's mom. The industry is your baby's mom. You defer to the industry when they have a cold. Um, my baby's only been sick once mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was a little bit of a tummy bug. I think when he started eating, I gave him some sushi rice. Ah. Um, and he, I don't think his belly liked that, but he had a <laughs> slight fever. I gave him homeopaths and, and my breast milk creates all the antibodies he needs. His fever didn't even last two days. Mm. Um, no cough. He has. He doesn't spit up. He doesn't have um, a bunch of snot at all. Mm. Um, he's extremely alert. Uh, fast learning curve, and I believe this is because of the absence of medical industrial intervention in his life. Yeah, that sounds. That all sounds great, and I would love to talk at length with you for much longer but unfortunately we have to uh wrap things up <laughs> here <laughs> dang yeah um is there um are there any places where people can reach you if they want to mm. work with you or if they want to see your work in some way or another yeah so um i'm as i'm being a stay-at-home mom right now i am not currently doing one-on-one -on -one in person treatments mm -hmm. um chinese medicine or otherwise um i do have a patreon patreon.com backslash muse medicina that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com backslash M-U-S-E-M-E-D-I-C-I-N-A, Muse Medicina. Patreon is an online forum where you can re reciprocate content makers. So I do a lot of online video education, hmm. and that's what you'll find at my Patreon. Um, you can also find me on Facebook at Muse Medicina, Instagram at Muse Medicina. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much where you can find me. I also highly recommend you follow, if you're in an Instagrammer, uh, the work of Dr. Rosales Mesa and of Invige Mama, as well as Lady Speech Sankofa, are all about like reclaiming the power of our bodies and minds post-colonialism. Great. Thank you for that. If you are interested, follow all of those places there. Patreon is a great platform to support um, independent people doing whatever it is. It's a very direct relationship between mm -hmm. payer and uh, creator of that sort. Um, Sacred Voices will be back the fourth Friday of September. And I'm blanking on what actual day that is of the month. But we are here at Denver Open Media the fourth Friday of every month. The doors open at 6 p.m. and the show starts at 6.30. And for September, that will be the 27th. I hope to see you all there. Thank you for tuning in once again. You are listening to Sacred Voices on KGNU. My name is Aston. Eutimia? Yes. Thank you for being here very much. Thank you I, for having me. Yes, I greatly appreciate the conversation. And we will see you next time. Many blessings.